This problem describes a famous experiment that was performed by Otto von Guericke in 1654 for the noblemen of the Holy Roman Empire as a demonstration of his invention, the vacuum pump. The experiment involved two teams of horses pulling on either end of these hollow brass hemispheres that were called uh, the Magdeburg hemispheres, named after the uh, the city where the experiment took place, and the horses could not pull it apart. Uh, here is a modern photo of the actual hemispheres that were used. Uh, they were put together to form a hollow sphere, and the vacuum pump was used to empty much of the air out of the sphere, also known as evacuating the hemispheres, so that the difference in air pressure between the outside and the inside of the sphere would make it extremely hard to remove the hemispheres again. Uh, also, here is a photo of a very famous uh, contemporary woodcut uh, showing the experiment, where you can see that there are eight horses on either side of the little hemisphere in the center, uh, pulling on either end. Ultimately, they were unable to remove the hemispheres. So we are asked, in the first part of the problem, to show that the force that would be required uh, to pull the hemispheres apart should be equal to pi times the radius squared times uh, delta P, or the change in pressure. Uh, where more specifically, the delta P refers to the difference between the pressures inside and outside the sphere. In other words, we are meant to show how this uh, equation is derived. And uh, we are also shown by this diagram that the capital R represents the radius from the center of the sphere to the edge of one of the hemispheres. And for the purposes of this problem, we are assuming that the thickness of the walls of the hemisphere are considered negligible, so that the radius of the hemisphere is seen as both the inside and the outside radius. Anyway, so we want to show this is derived. So anyway... The pressure difference between two surfaces can be related as delta P is equal to force divided by area, where the change in pressure is proportional to the force applied, but inversely proportional to the surface area over which the force is applied. And this is the basic formula we typically use for problems involving force or pressure. Uh, so because we're deriving a formula for force, Let's uh, multiply both sides by area here because we want to isolate force on its own because we're trying to find a formula for force. So these areas cancel out, and we end up with a formula that tells us that the force we're going to need is going to be equal to the change in pressure, or the pressure difference, times the surface area across which this force is being applied. Because we're trying to separate the hemispheres from one another, the effective area from which we're trying to remove a single hemisphere is this circular cross-section area here, where the hemispheres connect. Also, because the hemispheres are being pulled away from each other, and the forces will be equally balanced, we can simplify this problem a bit by focusing on only a single hemisphere, and it won't change our answer. So I'm, I'm crossing out this hemisphere right here so that we can focus our equations on just this rightmost hemisphere here, for instance. Now, since the area of a circle is given as pi times the radius squared, uh, and we can substitute this formula for the area in for uh, the a variable here in the previous formula, and our formula becomes uh, delta change in pressure, delta p, times... Uh, pi r squared. This represents the force due to pressure acting on the cross-sectional area of the sphere parallel to the horizontal axis in which we're pulling, but acting in the opposite direction. And that's what this represents. Now it seems that we have already gotten the formula we're trying to find, so it looks as though we've already achieved our goal. Because uh, if we were to move this delta p to the end here, we'll see that this is the same formula that we're asked to find in the first place. However, the problem with this method is that it's not very rigorous. Uh, 
While this solution certainly works, most professors might not be satisfied with this explanation because it sort of oversimplifies the geometry of the sphere without really rigorously proving that the pressure acting on the sphere opposite to the pulling force will necessarily be the same as the pressure acting on the cross-sectional area in the middle of the sphere. So, to prove this more thoroughly, we'll have to use some calculus. First off, here is a drawing of the hemisphere with the outside forces from the pressure acting on it. And note that a fluids, and note that fluids uh, exert a pressure on all sides of an object. Uh, so here I've drawn the arrows all along the right side of the right hemisphere, uh, but I didn't include any arrows on this left side here because this is where it, it connects with the other hemisphere. So the air pressure isn't impacting this cross-sectional area of the sphere right there. And also I showed a little x-axis right here to represent our coordinates. Now the force trying to pull the hemisphere off comes from the right, pulling in the positive x direction. Now theoretically, in order for the horses to be able to pull the hemisphere off, their horizontal force in the positive x direction must be at least equal in magnitude to the horizontal component of the total force due to pressure acting on the hemisphere. However, since we're dealing with a spherical shape here, the x component of the pressure acting on the sphere is going to be different just about anywhere on this diagram. So, to derive a formula that incorporates all the x components of the sphere, we'll have to use some differential elements to represent the area over which the pressure force is acting on the sphere, and then integrate those force vectors over the entire surface area of the hemisphere. Let's call the required horizontal force F sub h uh, for horizontal, the h for horizontal, and this is going to be equal to uh, delta p, or the pressure difference, times the surface area, as per the formula we discussed earlier. Now, on the diagram of the hemisphere, uh, we have defined the x-axis, and now let's choose an arbitrary angle from the axis to use. All right, and here I have uh, drawn a line at, at an arbitrary angle, which I've labeled as theta. Now, let's draw a second angle right next to it that is meant to represent uh, an angle element or an angle difference between these two angles. Let's call it d theta. And that represents the tiny angle right here. Now, this angle may look somewhat large, but keep in mind that it only looks that way for the purposes of this visual sketch. In reality, this is meant to represent an infinitesimal or infinitely small angle, which will give us an infinitesimal subtended angle on the diagram, and as such, an infinitesimal surface area on the sphere that this d theta is creating here. So let's define the element uh, dA to represent that infinitely small surface area on the sphere right here. Now let's go back to our f sub h formula. Based on the placement of our angle theta with the x-axis, the x components alone of the direction of the pressure force on the sphere can be represented as uh, delta p, or change in pressure, times uh, the cosine of theta. If you know your SOHCAHTOA, then it should be pretty easy to work out why this is. Uh, because the cosine of an angle is equal to the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And in this case, our adjacent side is the x-axis, which is the direction of the force vector, in which it's pulling. And it's divided by the hypotenuse of this angle, which in this case is uh, this d theta angle right here that is in the same direction, roughly, as the force due to pressure vectors acting on the sphere. Uh, so it's going to be the same as, effectively, the force divided by the pressure difference. 
And so it's easy to see now how we can sort of multiply both sides by the change in pressure to get this new formula for the, uh, the force due to pressure. But substituting this in and the dA element into our horizontal force equation, then we end up with this new formula for the horizontal force required, where it's equal to the change in pressure times the cosine of the angle theta times that infinitesimal area element. We're getting warmer, but we still need to find a better way to represent the area of this uh, infinitesimal element on the surface of the sphere. Don't forget, although this 2D drawing looks like a circle, you have to remember that the real shape being represented here is a three-dimensional sphere. It has a z-axis, and we need to represent this z-axis somehow as well as part of our area element. Therefore, I will expand on this infinitesimal element by adding the same d theta angle to the opposite side of the x-axis, as I'm going to draw here. So as you can see here, I've shown this angle at the same angle theta from the x-axis, but in the opposite direction. And uh, we have an angle element here represented by the same d theta. Now if we imagine that this d theta angle is rotating around the z and y dimensions of the sphere, and we consider the surface area subtended by the angle all to be part of the same d theta element, then our area becomes a sort of ring traveling, circling around the x-axis of the sphere. If you're not sure how this would make it a ring, then here is a view on the sphere from the positive x-axis with the dA element darkened to show how we have this ring-shaped surface area on the sphere, which is, again, actually meant to represent an infinitely thin area. And I've also darkened it on uh, our original diagram here to show what this would look like from the side. So now that our dA element is more properly defined, let's go about writing a formula for the dimensions of this ring in terms of a variable that we can integrate to represent the total surface area of the hemisphere. Now, first of all, the radius of this ring, let's try and find that. So let's call it a lowercase r, and, I'll, and I'm specifically calling it lowercase so that we can distinguish it from the capital R that the question defines for it. Uh, the problem gives us this capital R to represent uh, the radius of the hemisphere itself, but we want a new radius, a radius to represent just the radius of this ring-shaped element here. Uh, so if the, if the radius r of this ring is equivalent to the distance from one point on the ring to the x-axis, then r is going to be equal to uh, the capital R times the sine of theta, which once again uh, is pretty basic trigonometry SOHCAHTOA because sine of an angle, or sine of theta, is equal to uh, the side opposite of the angle divided by the hypotenuse of the angle, which in this case, the side opposite of the angle is the, the radius that we seek, or the small r, divided by the hypotenuse, which is gonna be represented by the capital R, the radius from the center of the hemisphere to the edge of the hemisphere, or capital R, and once again, dividing both sides by this capital R, and we end up with this formula for the radius of the ring right here in terms of theta. Let's also find a formula for the width of the ring. Now, the width of this ring can be seen as the thickness of the arc, uh, the length subtended by the d theta angle. Now, because a subtended arc length is equal to the radius of an angle times the angle itself, uh, the thickness of the ring is going to be equal to r times d theta, because r is the radius of the hemisphere, the distance from the center of the angle here to the edge, times d theta, the little angle in between these two lines here. And I'm just calling it s, the, the subtended length. But we want to find a formula for the area of the ring as a whole. 
Because this ring's area is going to be infinitely small, we can intuitively think of the area of the ring as being equal to the circumference of the ring multiplied by the width of the ring. Uh, now, the circumference of any circle is going to be equal to uh, 2 pi times the radius of a circle. So in this case, the circumference of the ring is going to be equal to 2 pi, and again, times the radius of the ring. And in this case, we have the radius of the ring as given by capital R times the sine of theta. So I'm going to add that in here. And times the thickness of the ring. So I'm also going to be multiplying by R, the cap again, capital R, times d theta. So this tells us what the dA element is going to be equal to. And we can simplify it a bit further by recognizing that since we have two capital R's in the formula, uh, these will just be equal to capital R squared. So we can simplify our dA element as being equal to 2 pi times the radius squared times the sine of theta d theta. Now plugging all of this back into our horizontal formula, uh, the, the formula for the horizontal force required, uh, which we have in terms of dA, if we sub all this in for dA, then we get a further expanded formula for the horizontal force of the difference in pressure times the cosine of theta times uh, 2 pi r squared times the sine of theta d theta. All of this represents the horizontal force of the air pressure acting on an infinitesimally small ring of the hemisphere. But we want a formula that gives us the horizontal force acting on every point of the hemisphere. Therefore, we'll need to integrate this entire formula with respect to d theta as the angle theta increases from the positive y-axis. So I will add a little integral symbol right here. We will also have to determine the bounds of integration. If we take the angle theta to be zero, or very close to zero, then the ring we described earlier will be representing the area on the rightmost portion of the hemisphere. And as the angle increases, the ring represents a portion on the area of the sphere moving further and further to the left, right up until we've reached a right angle value, where the ring's area has finished passing through the surface area of the entire hemisphere. So our lower bound will be 0 degrees, or 0 radians, and our upper bound will be 90 degrees, or pi divided by 2 radians. It is now time to evaluate our integral. So because we are integrating with respect to theta, all of the non-theta terms can be treated as constants and moved outside of the integral. All right, so here I have moved all of the non-theta terms outside of the integral here. So we now have to integrate sine of theta times cosine of theta with respect to theta, which is pretty easy to integrate if you use u substitution but personally, I think it's even easier to evaluate if you just use the trigonometric identity, which states that sine of theta times cosine of theta is equal to one-half of sine of two of theta, a term that is even easier to integrate directly. So here I have substituted that in for the sine of theta times cosine of theta. And uh, also, this one-half here is a constant that doesn't have a theta in it. So we can uh, technically, we can imagine us taking that out of the integral as well, which means it will actually cancel out with this 2 there, since 2 divided by 2 is just 1, so it just disappears. So that has simplified our integral somewhat as well. Now using basic common integrals, the integral of the sine function is a negative cosine function, and then in order to reverse the effects of a potential chain rule differentiation of this term, we'll also have to divide this by the integral of 2 theta with respect to theta, which is just 2. And this is our result. Now that we have integrated, we still have to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to deal with the bounds of integration. All right, so here I have applied the fundamental theorem of calculus 
Uh, I've plugged in pi over 2 for this uh, first term here, and then 0 for the other term. Now uh, the 2's will cancel out here. 2 times pi divided by 2 is just going to be pi. And the cosine of pi is negative 1, but the negatives cancel out, so this first term just becomes 1 divided by 2, or 1 half. Now for the second term, uh, cosine of 0 is 1, uh, but the other two negatives will cancel out. So again, it's just a positive one-half. So we're adding one-half plus one-half, which is just one. So all that we are left with is that F sub H is equal to pi times the radius squared times the pressure difference, which is exactly what we were given at the start of the problem. In other words, this formula for certain represents the minimum force required to remove the hemispheres from one another. Now, if you ever need to perform an experiment like this, you will be able to figure out exactly how much force you'll need to use to take the hemispheres apart, and you'll know exactly how to rigorously derive the formula. Now, parts B and C of this problem are fortunately much easier. Part B tells us that the radius of the hemispheres, the capital R, is 30 centimeters, or 0 0.30 meters. It also tells us that the pressure inside the spheres, or P sub I, is 0 0.10 atmospheres, and the pressure outside the spheres is 1 atmosphere. Now we are asked to actually uh, calculate the exact force the horses would have needed to pull apart the hemispheres, using the formula we derived in the previous part of the problem. So again, using this formula we got before, the only variables we need to fill in are the radius, which we have an SI unit, says uh, 0.30 meters. So that's pi times 0 0.30 meters squared times the pressure difference. And 1 minus 0 0.1 is equal to 0.9 atmospheres, which we will need to convert into pascals. So here I've plugged in the pressure difference, 0.9 atmospheres, and multiplied it by the conversion, where uh, 1 atmosphere is equal to 1.01 times 10 to the fifth power of pascals. Now this gives us a pressure difference of 9.09 .09 times 10 to the fourth power of pascals, or Pa. And that is the force required to pull the hemispheres apart. Part C, the final part of the problem, is actually a pretty basic conceptual question. We are asked why two identical teams of horses pulling on either side of the Magdeburg hemispheres would actually have had the exact same effect as one team of horses pulling on one side of the sphere with the other side attached to the wall. The reason actually has nothing to do with fluid mechanics, and is instead the result of Newton's third law of motion, which states that a force exerted on another object will be exerted back in equal magnitude and opposite direction. When one team of horses is pulling on one hemisphere, and the other hemisphere is attached to a sturdy wall, this is exactly the same as two identical teams of horses pulling on either hemisphere. While the horses pull at a force uh, F sub H away from the wall, the wall will exert a force equal and opposite to the horses. So the force of the wall on the sphere will balance the force of the horses. And that is just about everything there is to know about the physics behind Agarica's famous Magdeburg Hemisphere experiment.